Hey, hey, what is happening, YouTube? It is Gas Mass and Hand Grenades. My name is Jeff. We are here with an interview tonight, and I've got a co-host, which I don't usually do a lot of collaborative interviewing. I usually do that on my own, but tonight's kind of special, uh, mainly because if it wasn't for this person to my, I don't know, whichever way I'm pointing, one of these to ways. <laughs> if it wasn't for Lauren, my daughter, uh, I'm not sure that I would have actually done this because she really was into this act when we saw them at decibel fest and i really enjoyed them as well and she's like you should see if um you should see if aln wants to come on i'm like you know what i think i'm gonna do that and i started checking the material out and i was like yeah we're definitely gonna do that so lauren this is all your fault ALN Thank you. can blame you for all this so yeah of course so if it right. goes bad it's my fault <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so lauren is my co-host tonight riding shotgun with me um Tonight, we're joined with the enigmatic, enigmatic artist ALN, who is the creative force behind the Blackened Atmospheric Doom One Metal Band project band, uh, Mismore. While I've been aware of Mismore since 2020, uh, or 2020, excuse me, uh, when I checked out the latest full length Cairn, it wasn't until seeing the project perform live, and they do perform as a full live band, by the way, which we'll get into at Decibel Fest a few weeks ago that I looked a little bit deeper uh, into the uh, creative output and checked all the albums out because black metal as a whole isn't always my thing. I'm a little bit more of a death metal dude and a, a prog metal dude. You guys all know my, my shtick, but I really enjoyed what I heard and I, I read up a little bit on ALN. And I'm like, you know, I want to have this guy on and talk to him a little bit. So um, my daughter Lauren, again, was really taken by the live performance, picked up a few of the things. Uh, my good buddy Rick also picked up a few uh, items. From the show so yeah so i asked aln to join me and uh so we can gain a better perspective on the music and the message he's looking to convey let's get aln in here sir how are you hey doing hey, good this is where we pretend we didn't talk for five or ten minutes before right before. right who, who are you yeah who, where I've never seen yeah. <laughs> i just good. materialized i'm trying to figure it out you know oh, bro, that's that so ALN cool. magic right yeah um so thanks again for being here. We did this fairly quickly, and I appreciate you doing it, you know, being uh, willing to jump on quickly here. We don't have a long time. I, if you notice, some of my interviews get very long. Yeah, That's not all me talking, by the right. way. It's not <laughs> right. me talking, but Luke, I just wound him up and let him go. He was like, boom, he was off and running. You saw, uh, him, at the, you saw him at the merch table. You know how he, he rolls. He's totally. Um, but uh, let me start with, the decibel fest because that's where i where we saw you and i was aware of you i had listened to karen back in 2020 i believe that came out in 2019 but i didn't latch on to it until 2020 and um you know there was so much happening when we went into lockdown it was constant bombardment with everything and you're kind of so i didn't actually pick the album up but lauren you did pick up what'd you get uh i got karen and um what was it? Uh, Wits uh -oh. End on cassette. Wits End, okay. Oh, cool. And I believe Rick bought Wits End or one of the other albums, so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Um, I'm on a very limited income, so I couldn't really do anything at the time because of my illness. So um, how was Decibel Fest for you? What what was your experience with the whole thing? It was a lot of fun. Um, my experience with the fest, I think, is best understood in the context of the fact that I was on tour with another band called Hell. Uh, we share three members with Mesmore. The lineup's only different by one person. Um, so we already had this Hell tour uh, scheduled and we, we kind of planned the routing so that we could be in Philly on the right day and just kind of become Mesmore and right. play this show. Uh, so we taught um, the one person in Hell, Sheen, who's not in Mesmore regularly, we taught him the set um, he's the guitarist in hell, but uh, okay. all of us in those in the, those two projects, we kind of all play everything. And it was my Mismore's drummer that wouldn't be there, so uh, Sheen hop, hopped on the drum set and uh, learned a, a short set so that we could make the show happen. So, you know, we were like th three weeks in to a U.S. tour at that point already, and then we had to like shake it up and uh, play a different set all of a sudden and switch instruments and uh, 
and then go on our way and be hell again. Um, yeah. So that was very interesting. The other part that was really interesting to me uh, was that, at least on the day we played, we were the only, I think the only non-death metal band. Uh, That's correct. Yeah, I mean, Black Dahlia has a little bit of a black edge sure, to them, but not sure. much. You're, you were definitely the black metal band, yeah. So we, like, you know, the black metal, but also the doom, the like, doom. We, we really changed up the vibe. Loaded and, down uh, <laughs> I was I was curious about how that would go over because uh, we didn't sound like the other bands, but it seemed like we were uh, really really well received and uh, oh, there yeah. was uh, you know an intentional and uh, welcome change of pace and we had a lot of fun. We felt we felt great. We were treated really well there and uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, Albert Albert's a first class act. He's they, they yeah just, they do everything really really well the facilities there are great it's a great venue obviously yeah it was perfectly on we got there unfortunately we just missed worm we just missed him we just got there as undeath was going on and i kind of wanted to see worm would have been the other black metal kind of band but they're they're a bit faster pace a little bit more in the uh skip kind of do it all yeah yeah the, the the eerie keyboard stuff you guys are a little bit more stripped down more the doom thing so mm -hmm. yeah it was cool and i remember you know when you guys came out i remembered the album and i said to lauren i said i think you might like this band and i think you might dig it and i could tell right away she totally dug it um as i said me for black metal i'm a little bit more picky man i'm, I'm actually mm -hmm. very picky about black metal it kind of anyways that's another story for another time <laughs> but but yeah, I like a lot of it, but I don't, I'm not always, I'm not a black metal diehard, you know, elite, completist type guy. So um, let's move on real quickly here, since I know I want to try to keep you in that hour. Oops, hold on. There we go. Um, tell me a little bit about your first memories of music and how that kind of early exposure to music might have affected you. I'm going to guess, are you in your late 30s, early 40s? I am 32. You're, okay, you're early yeah. 30s. Okay, yeah. so you're you're not a whole lot older than Lauren. Lauren's 28. Okay, so yeah. I'm an old man. I'm pushing 60. Crazy. So <laughs> sure. it's, it's um, you know, my experience is vastly different from from what you guys. The good thing is Lauren had me to infiltrate her mind with a lot of great, great music. Right, Lauren? Say just not. Yeah. <laughs> so give me a, a little bit of an idea of where you know what what. <clears throat> What's your first memories of music affecting you were? For sure. Uh, well, my, my family's musical, so I, I grew up around music, and uh, my dad is a drummer, and so I kind of started learning drums from my dad. He bought a drum kit for himself and for, I have two brothers, for us to just kind of mess around on, and I started playing the drums around like third grade, uh, my dad taught me the basics. I took lessons for a while, and then I went self-taught. And uh, similar to, with, with guitar, uh, I learned that from my brothers uh, probably around the fifth grade and took some lessons for a while and then was self-taught. And so we were always, all of us boys had different bands that would practice at the house. And uh, I think I was in my first uh, band in like maybe fourth or fifth grade Holy crap, and really? I've, I've been uh making uh albums where i do all the instruments and the art and like physically make them and sell them to kids at school since sixth grade uh so that process for me has has been long lasting and just evolved over the years different genres different styles and influences and whatnot but i've kind of always uh made music to process my thoughts and feelings. And um, a big part of that has been the kind of solo experience um, as well as being in, in bands. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been most of my life being steeped in music. I definitely had to find, definitely got most of my influences when I was a kid from my brothers. Uh, Are my, they older or? They're, they're older, I'm the youngest and uh, I don't have the same music taste as my parents, and we were also pretty sheltered, so there was a lot of stuff we weren't really allowed to listen to. Um, but it got it got heavier over the years, and uh, yeah, I guess the rest is history. Do you remember like what the first? I don't, you know, like 
I, it's run the gamut. You know, for me, my first musical experience was the things I really remember are like Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with that. Or Love it, yeah. Carol King, Tapestry, or mm -hmm. you know, the very early 70s stuff, because I was born in 66. My mom was not a Beatles or a Stones fan. She was more the AOR of the time, the album-oriented rock stuff of the time. So you had that, and then Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. My dad was a, a, a classical guy. You know, for Lauren, you, it probably was, do you even remember? <laughs> Like what the f you listen to a lot of music I forced you guys to listen to yeah and we drove back. I think Alice in Chains was one of the first bands I got like super obsessed with when nice. I was a lot younger like early teenager I knew I did my job I well still love them <laughs> hell so, yeah yeah but I mean do you remember any of that stuff from like what you first kind of may, may have first encountered that you know wasn't maybe the christian stuff because i think that might be what you're kind of alluding to a little bit yeah 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 outside of uh christian music i think uh me and my brother's first favorite artist uh person that we were allowed to listen to was weird al and wow. i'm talking i'm talking when i was like a little kid uh, went and saw him. That was my first concert at the Oregon State Fair. Oh, no way. And a lot of those songs were the first time I heard those songs. I didn't know the real versions. Uh, so that's, that's kind of fun. fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, as I, as I uh, got a little bit older, like by the, the end of elementary school, I was listening to, like, the heavy bands I was allowed to listen to, like in the Christian world, like my my favorite band was like P.O.D. I don't know if you know who that yep. is, but Table on Death, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So it's that live. So I'm open oh, cool. From, so I'm open from Mashuga, Mashuga, and um, System of a Down, <laughs> which nice. I won tickets to. I went to go see Mashuga, so there you go. But uh, did you okay. listen to um, Red at all? I know they're like they were a pretty Red. popular Christian rock no. band. No, oh, I didn't okay. listen to that one. Yeah, no, that that was a band I was like into when I was like a teenager, um, and I didn't even know they were like a Christian metal band until like way later after the fact. See, now the Christian, the Christian heavier band that I listened to, who do you think it was? You had Petra. To Petra. Petra would be one, but that was they were actually a little prior to this band, Striper. Striper oh, man, I was yeah, a big totally. Fan loved, still love that first. Uh, well, not the first album. The, Soldiers and to Hell with the Devil. Saw them actually on to Hell with the Devil. That'll show you how old I actually am there. You know? <laughs> um, so you, drums was the first thing, and then you picked mm -hmm. up guitar and kind of like, uh, va like sounds to me like you kind of do a little bit of everything. Can you play the keyboards too a little bit? Like, Yeah, a little bit. Plunk around on chords and stuff like that? Definitely, yeah. Um, sounds like your parents were pretty nurturing in that regard because your dad was a drummer and, and encouraged that. Um, did you, when you get to high school and stuff now, you're, are, are you actually putting together like a real band at that point or is it still the teenage type band stuff? Uh, near the end of high school, I kind of had a real band. Uh, it's called Sorceress and uh, it was a stoner metal band that um, actually two of the, the dudes that uh, I still play with in Hell and Mismore, uh, MSW or, or Matt and uh, Andrew Black. Uh, this was one of our old bands. We've been playing music. I've been playing music with Andy for 20 years and 15 with Matt. So this was one of our bands that kind of, we were starting to get into heavier music and wanting to play metal and stuff. And kind of as near the end of Sorceress, Matt was starting Hell. And after a couple of years, I was starting Mismore. So that kind of, was a, a breaking off point for us and I mean we were still it was still teenage in the sense that like we mainly played Salem and every once in a while we'd get a gig in Portland and uh and but how old are you now what's that how old are you now right now no at oh at, at the time uh 18 17 okay, 18 just, that, just about ready to get out of high school or yeah yeah, yeah totally uh and and, it, and it's been fun because actually through like through people's interest in in hell and mismore um we actually had our, our friend todd's label uh king volume records which is a stoner doom psych metal kind of label uh they just put out the sorceress album as a record no uh, in in march yeah so oh, actually, it's gotten I'll, some what's that I'll, I'll you go ahead i'll be right back oh sure okay. and so here you want to hear a really bizarre thing Ninth grade, tenth grade, my first band. Guess what it was called? Sorcerer's Song. Uh, nice. 
No lie, Sorcerer's Song was the name, and it was you know the whole swords and sorcery, uh, you know, yeah. Elric of Melnabone, Franz Lieber, you know, all that kind of, or Fritz Lieber, I guess was his name, all that kind of swords and sorcery stuff. We were totally into that. When I saw that you were in a band, Sorcerer's, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, man. What are the chances? You know, that, I mean, it's not exact. <laughs> Hey, um, nice. I actually grabbed this online um from what are they called? Dark Sun Records. Gray Sun. Gray Sun. Gray Sun. That's yeah. It. What is it? Um, yeah. So that is the, uh, the one of the sorceress. Oh um, no way! It, it actually says sorceress and Ms. Moore. Yeah. It. So, so that that tape is that's an interesting one. So sorceress, we only made one full length album uh, before we broke up. Um, but right before we broke up, there were a couple songs that I was writing for the band and uh, recording on my laptop, just doing everything. Uh, and these songs never got fleshed out. And right after I finished them, I started working on uh, some stuff that would take me in the direction of Mismore. And so I think we put that tape out in 2016. It's the two like lost sorceress songs that are just me, and wow. this one this one song uh, that I that I called Mismore Zero because it, it precedes that okay. the first yeah. official uh, Mismore release. But it was I almost did it as a, a black metal song, and you can hear you can hear the similarities, and it was all done in the same production style as my first Mismore album. So that's kind of the uh, the transition tape between Sorceress era and, and the Mismore era. I yeah. didn't know you picked that up. That's cool. That's really neat. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Did you go off to school after high school? Did you go to college? Did you go to trade school? Did you get, or did you start working? Or what, what was the projected projection there? Yeah. Uh, I, I graduated high school a year early, and I took a year to just work. And then I became a really devout Christian and I moved to Germany and went to a Bible school over there and studied the Bible for six months. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know you've talked about this a lot, so we don't have to beat that to a dead horse because a lot of your material with Mismore revolves around your loss of faith and all that kind of stuff, which we'll get into a little bit. But... Um, so you didn't actually you didn't actually go to college. You were actually going to like Bible college to become a, a minister or a priest or? I did do a, a couple years of incomplete uh, community college classes. Um, but then I abandoned that to go study the Bible. And it wasn't um, like a seminary. I, I wasn't, it wasn't an accredited thing and I wasn't going to, uh, you know, with the intent of be uh, with a profession in mind right. okay. uh it was more of like a evangelical thing where people from all over the world different countries would come and we'd live in this little community together and uh we would consume lots of lectures and have you know homework assignments from the scriptures we would do outreach um so it was more of like a faith-based lifestyle with okay. bible education um, but not, no one was there like, yeah, I'm taking, and this is a course I'm checking off so that I can become a pastor. You right. Know? Okay. Wasn't gotcha. quite like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, but I did want to do that. I think at some point it's like, well, that'll probably be the, the path I take. Cause my, you're kind of setting yourself up for that potentially. Yeah. yeah. What, um, what music musicians and artists really affected and influenced you as a, young developing musician drummer guitarist you know what now we're into like high school what stuff's starting to hit you are you able at this point now to get into the iron maidens get into the more heavier stuff or are you still sheltered at that point yeah yeah i listen to that kind of stuff uh i think f the first thing that i was like really influenced by uh to make my own music was like the classic rock stuff i liked Led Zeppelin a lot, Pink Floyd, The Doors, uh, and then I kind of got into more experimental music. I, I liked Radiohead a lot, Sigur Rose, Godspeed, um, oh, yeah. awesome. and and kind of through through the classic rock avenue is how I got into metal. Because for me, at first, it was like you know Pink Floyd, like long form experimental songs with like simple drums. 
And then for some reason that was an easy transition to Black Sabbath, which is like also long and, and slow sometimes and, and simple in a way, but like heavy in the same way that Led Zeppelin is. So I became really into Black Sabbath and from Black Sabbath came interest in Electric Wizard, The Sword, Sleep, Witch, Donova, uh, these kinds of bands. So I went into the Stoner Doom route and then eventually got into like really evil, heavy sounding uh, doom metal like Burning Witch and kind of black metal, like the Cascadian style at least, like Wolves in the Throne Room, Wolves, kind of around yeah. the same time. And then I yeah, just fell, it, fell in love with Yob? both of those. Because Yob are from yeah. Eugene, right? I mean, were they ever, was that ever an influence? Did you ever listen to Yob much? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I love Yob. I saw them for the first time when, when Sleep first reunited and came on tour and they played Portland. Yob opened for them. And I was like, holy shit. I had never heard of them before. I was like, this band is so heavy. Mike yeah, I is, love those Mike dudes. Just amazing, dude. What an amazing performer. He is. I'm going to see them hopefully on the ninth down in Philly. I don't know if you're going to go, Lauren, or not. But, uh, man, I'm, they, uh, I saw them with Voivod. I've only seen them once. And it was kind of almost a religious experience. Just, mm. just Mike is such an incredible vocal performer and just... He's so into the music, man. You can't walk away from that thinking that guy mailed it in tonight. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. You just don't. So for sure. Um, yeah. So what about the like the candle mass and that like the Euro Doom where you kind of and you know of course Merciful Fade and stuff like that. They're not Doom, but I mean that yeah. kind of stuff, right? I kind of had to uh, backtrack and get into that stuff a little later. Um, I, I didn't. I, I didn't so much like like late 70s 80s doom uh when i was first getting into the genre uh it's very uh theatrical and operatic and to me that sounded really cheesy uh so it, it took me like a while to become a, just a, a full-fledged fan of the genre and then be like okay let's maybe go back and see why people like these bands and and find find reasons to to like them but it didn't it didn't that kind of stuff didn't grab me right away i don't think it was dark enough how about black metal what black metal bands were the big the big aha moments well the gateway was was wolves in the throne room okay. uh for sure uh then then i i kind of uh and kind of other cascadian bands like fauna and leech uh right. and then i kind of backtracked to figure out where you know the roots of this music comes from and, and what other examples of this music I like and I got really into Drut and Burzum and um, other some other classics Emperor and and Immortal, shit like that guys, yeah absolutely we went guys. went through all all that stuff and and uh, yeah you yeah. mentioned Leech is that uh, Paul yes is that Paul's what is one of his old bands okay that's right yeah so. yeah yeah okay um, yeah because he was from out there I believe right yeah, I we uh, Paul and I grew up in in Salem. Oh wow! No kidding. You know each other or knew each other or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh wow, uh, that's cool. I first met Paul. Um, I think it, he was probably, you know, eighth grade or freshman year, and I was, you know, maybe in fifth or sixth grade, because uh, we had uh, my my best friend uh, and his best friend were brothers, so we wow. would. Uh, we were the annoying little kids that w were also at the house hanging yeah. out, bothering them. Oh, uh, God. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a of, he's like, what, about mid-30s, right? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. I think he's maybe three or four years older yeah. than me. How yeah. about that? That's crazy. That's super cool. That's awesome. First album you bought with your own money? I don't know. Don't remember? I, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. And you said your first concert was Weird, weird Out, which is weird because it ties into us talking about us being from Lancaster and the Amish Paradise thing. So oh, cool. hell yeah. yeah. Boom, right? We had we had that Bad Hair Day VHS. I've <laughs> watched that thing so many times. Tell us about your, uh, tell us about creating Ms. Moore then. I think he kind of got into a little bit. Was, what was the sequence of things as far as how Ms. Moore, Ms. Moore came out of the Sorceress thing, right? You uh, it was the thing I did after Sorceress and I think they're connected in the sense that it's like, uh, heavy music, um, but thematically they are very, very different. Um, 
Sorceress is just like fantasy music with some personal experiences worked in, but like heavily veiled in symbolism. Uh, and Mismore's just like honest, emotional uh, music that I made to like deal with grief. Uh, so it's a lot more real. Uh, and so I started making that music after, uh, through my experience with, with Christianity around the time that I was leaving Germany, I was incredibly depressed more so than normal and having a lot of doubts about the faith and, uh, what I was doing with my life. And I still continued on and, and struggled with that for a while after I got back, but I started writing the, the Mismore songs as, uh, prayers to God, um, because I couldn't like pray or read the Bible or worship anymore. All I could do is just write this music. The first record is actually like written in the second person. It's actually like literally prayers to God. Uh, and it's kind of uh, my, my Psalms, my, my prayers saying like, I think I'm gonna stop doing this. And if, if you get this, come find me but I'm out. So just to make something clear, I think you more or less said it here. Your, your leaving was not a, one of leaving religion. It was leaving God, if I'm hearing correctly. Am I right about that? Uh, at first it was just uh, leaving Christianity. Uh, it, and not even, I mean, I didn't think of it in terms of that. It was just like, what I'm doing isn't working, so I have to try something else. And so at first, you know, I went from a Christian to a confused and bittered Christian to an agnostic to just nothing, and now I'm an atheist. And it was a really slow process that I can, you know, kind of apply those labels after the fact, thinking about it, but yeah. in the moment, it's just kind of all I have is my my thoughts and my feelings and my experiences and uh what i what i believed to be true wasn't adding up there was too much cognitive dissonance in my experience yeah. of the world uh and i just i had to change something and i was i was hoping that i was wrong uh and that you know uh you'd receive a sign right somewhere. yeah Somehow you get that great awakening right, right. but and you I have you have to you. do something at some at some you point right. you know yeah, if I hear you right, I, I think you and I have a lot in common. Now, I would say that I am a, now I'm not going to say what I, I, um, I, I'm not an atheist, but I'm like so far right up against it, my nose is in it. You know, for sure. I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm, for sure. I'm the hardest, hardest agnostic that you will ever find. Yeah. And, and I, I, I guess because I, I was Catholic. I was raised mm -hmm. Catholic, right? Didn't really practice much. We didn't do much. I got first communion stuff. But I, I just, if I hear you correctly, maybe your experience is mine, and that is, you look around, you see a world of suffering, just constant suffering, it seems, and how the cognitive, you, you hit it, the cognitive dissonance, just, it doesn't make any sense. It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. If you're a thinking person, if you are a person that, logically thinks things out it just mm -hmm. it just doesn't make any sense so we'll stop there because i don't want to i don't want to get too deep that's a conversation maybe for another live stream but, but sure um, real quick here i wanted to touch on the albums and lauren has a question so i wanted to get how i kind of wanted to do this was the first album comes out in 2012 as digital only self-released uh it was digital only for a few months i actually had no plans to even release it at all i just made it for me for my personal grieving process uh, but a friend encouraged me to put it on Bandcamp, so i did it was up there for a couple months and then someone reached out to me and uh they wanted they were like how do i get this cd i was like there aren't any so i just i just made him one uh, and then I was like, well, I shouldn't just make one. I'll, I'll make 10 or something. And then I made, you know, 20 more. And then I think all in all, there's like 75, but it was, uh, it, it was, it was a CD, but yeah, there, there was a couple months when it was just digital. Um, 
so it's never been widely reissued since then, right? Is that just? Oh, it, no, it has. Oh, it has. Uh, so, Gilead Media has put it Gilead out on vinyl. Out. Okay, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I apologize. I, I couldn't, in trying to get all the information down about the album, since I don't actually own them, I, I was like, okay, I don't know if this one's actually out or not. The yeah. other two I know are, so my apologies for that. No, um, you're good. That's an obscure one. <laughs> So an early theme for those was essentially about losing your faith in God. Was it, was it, and then I asked, was it religion or was it pointedly God? Uh, we elaborated on that so we can move on. Uh, you did a bunch of splits and mm -hmm. an EP following the debut album. Of note is the one project with Hell, which you play live drums for. So this is your buddies from high school? Yeah, yeah. So Hell, Hell is the, the solo project of MSW. And uh, he started, I think the first record came out in 2008 or 2009. And when he started the project, he didn't like to do his own vocals. So I actually do vocals on half that record and a couple other songs throughout his discography. And uh, once we kind of reconnected after I came back from Germany, he wanted to incorporate me into the live band. And so I do do drums and uh, we will do often do my songs where I do vocals and I'll do the, the vocals from the drum kit at now, our shows. Was he, was he the bass player or the other guitar player or who was in in, the in, in Mismore? Yeah, in Mismore? He's the other guitar player. He's the other guitarist, okay. Mm -hmm. He's with the super long air. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're almost there, Lauren. I'm, I'm, I swear I'll let you talk in one sec here. We, we kind of <laughs> were, were slotting this in to keep things moving. Um, 2016 and 2019, you released... Yod, is it Yoda? Yoda? Uh, I I like say Yod. Yod, I say Yod. Yod <laughs> and Cairn, respectively, on Gilead Media, and these are the albums that I'm more familiar with. And I'm interested in your influences and themes behind these albums. Now, it should be noticed that um, the symbolism of Yod is that's, I believe, the word in Hebrew means to, to raise your hands or your arms in a prayer or in uh, to the heavens in prayer is that correct or am i wrong uh are you talking about the word mismore or the word yod yod uh the word yod has a couple meanings and i'm not claiming to know all of the meanings you might not be wrong but i picked that title uh because it is that it's a letter it's that little tiny uh, like apostrophe looking thing and uh, -huh. uh and and it cor all the letters correspond to numbers as well and that uh, that corresponds to the number 10. And I used to number all of my songs. And the, the release I put out before that was song number nine. So it's kind of calling that whole record 10. And, and okay. it also relates to like, like the word iota, uh, like the, the smallest amount. Uh, and that was a big theme on Yod is feeling like I've been reduced to a, a, a speck uh, being yeah. so depressed and, uh, and, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah yeah um yeah what it said here was the the yod in hebrew means an arm or hand reaching towards the heaven in prayer or bowing in prayer karen means a man-made pile of stones or a burial marker so mm -hmm. the symbolism there might be you buried that guy and moved on is that kind of the thought or no you got it okay um you did start to actually give your songs titles then. <laughs> yeah. And you you probably took a little bit of a page out of, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Godspeed's arms, actually, <laughs> because you have long song titles, just like Godspeed has these, you know, exceptionally long album titles and stuff. Mm. Um, so tell us about the symbolism again of the, the themes that, the overarching themes of these two albums. Now, these are long albums. These are not short albums. These are... These are time investments. You can't just throw this on while you're driving to the supermarket and back. You know, I think both of them are in excess of an hour, I believe. Um, talk to me a little bit about the themes for both albums, and then we're going to let Lauren jump in. Sure. Uh, so, so for me, Yod is just an album about existential dread, um, kind of like post-belief, like feeling really empty and not having answers to questions that God and Christianity used to answer uh, and just feeling really, really depressed. Um, that album cover to me was like, 
exactly how I felt and exactly how the music sounded just gray and, and bleak and uh, horrifying. <laughs> and uh, Cairn is a much different record. Cairn is kind of my, my record about healing and closure and, and moving on from that place. Uh, Cairn is the record I made when I became comfortable uh, identifying as an atheist uh, that, uh, that used to make me really uncomfortable that I was getting to that point. Um, I didn't want to, essentially I didn't want to have any sort of world view anymore because I was so humbled and broken by uh, having mine shattered uh, that I, I wanted to claim to know nothing as long as possible until I started realizing that I actually I do have an opinion about this that's forming. Uh, and that made me uncomfortable for a while, but the, Karen is kind of me accepting that, embracing that, feeling good about that, and um, and moving on. Karen has uh, has two songs on it that allude to the title. One's called Karen to God, and one's called Karen to Suicide. And the album uh, was heavily influenced by the book Myth of Sisyphus, and explores uh, the themes of of you know there there's there's a few, there's three options you have to coming to the realization that the universe is ultimately meaningless and uh, that's to kill yourself, believe in God, or accept the absurd. Uh, and so that's, that's what Karen is about, is setting, wow. up, setting up the two Karens, one to suicide, one to God, saying there's nothing to be found here and choosing to walk the straight and narrow path of discomfort in this absurd life <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it man that's pretty that's pretty existential right there um lauren you had a, a question regarding uh, some of the sound which is really cool i thought uh yeah um i was gonna ask the the other one i had since i think it's a bit more topical um so we were just talking about how um your songs are very long mm -hmm. um and like that's a pretty common staple of like doom black and doom in general um and I, like one thing I'm like curious from your perspective is like, when do you feel like a song is like told its story or like finished what it has to say? And how do you like approach like the melodic story progression like of a song as you're writing it? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so my process always begins uh, with my acoustic guitar. I like to just sit alone with my instrument without worrying about uh, equipment and, and tone and stuff. At some point I have to translate what I've written into that world and make sure it works, but to get inspired I like to just sit with my guitar and, and write melodies. And uh, I, I don't know, it just it comes naturally I guess. I, I, I come up with a melody I like and then some sort of A, B alternation I can do and then, well, we got to go somewhere else, and uh, it kind of it kind of evolves naturally. And often, I'll do that. I'll have a couple of those that are disjointed, and I'll start to realize that they might work together well, uh, and to kind of aid in the storytelling aspect or the narrative kind of crafting of the songwriting I do. I, I might put like an ambient or a drone section in between the two to kind of take you somewhere else and then conclude things. Um, but I, I don't really have a good litmus test to, <laughs> at the end to be like, is this too long? Is this done yet? Uh, it kind of just writes itself and, and then I commit to it, uh, which maybe uh, isn't the best way to write music, uh, but it's just kind of what happens for me. I've kind of... My process has evolved a little bit, and I'm actually releasing a new record this summer uh, where the songwriting, uh, I practiced slightly different techniques and uh, trying to kind of trim the fat a little bit and, uh, and think about from a producer's standpoint, is, is this interesting, is this too long? Um, but the records we're talking about right now is just like, fuck it, 18 minutes? It's well, good with me. Yeah. The other, the, other thing, the other thing about that too is, Alan, you work in a medium that allows that. 
that's you true. Were trying to be yeah. a radio rock band or you were trying to be, uh, you know, even a, a modern day prog band, let's say a dream theater or something. They have, okay, they have some 30 minute songs, but they do sort of have a formula that they tend to, to slide into. You can kind of do what you want and it's finished when you want it to be finished, kind of. It, it's, you know, I, so Lauren, that was a great question, a fantastic question, but it's one of those things that when you're writing, and you know this, Lauren, because you're a very good guitar player, but you don't write a lot yourself, but you're an extremely good, both of us are, you know, we're both guitar players and have been for years, and she kicks my ass sometimes. It really bothers me, too. I don't let, I don't let her do it much, but great finger picker, by the way, goosey finger picker. Um, but you know that sometimes when you're writing something, it just kind of goes until it's not, you don't have anything more for it. It just kind of... And then you go, oh, you know, like in your medium with Ms. Moore, you can kind of do what you want. If you really want to make it a two, a double album with a whole 30 minute side of one song, you know, it just is what it is. You know, right. Yob. Yob's a good example of that. Some of their songs are 26, 27 minutes and then some are, you know, eight or nine. There's rarely a, I don't think you'd. I don't think you'd find a Yob song that's three and a half minutes. Though. I'm right. Sure that doesn't exist. But or you could just be Bellwitch now and make one song Witch. your entire album. Bellwitch yes. is another great. They're from uh, your area too, right? Yeah. Dylan and you probably know those guys. I would assume or Brunswick. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great. Yeah. So and and she's really into Bellwitch. But um, a great, great question. You also had another section of that there that you talked about. Um, what instrument? What uh, what kind of process? deciding what instrument will be responsible for a certain sound texture and how do you separate them so that things aren't super muddy. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you should ask the question. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, one of the other questions, um, like, there's, even though you do have, like, a lot of dynamics in your music, um, kind of when, like, the big heavy part hits, uh, you definitely go for, like, a wall of sound mm -hmm. uh, deal. Um, but I still feel like it's really easy to, like, pick all the instruments out and, um, like it feels like each i listen to some like metal bands and i'm just like like it's just like it feels like my head's being rattled but when i listen to your music i feel like i'm like oh the guitar is doing this the vocals are doing this the drums are doing this the bass is doing this um it what what's like your thought process like when you're actually doing like instrumentation like arrangement i guess is the main question yeah so so i think with a with something like that um it's kind of the sum the sum of all the parts like the reason things are distinct and sound clear uh has to do with the composition and arrangement it also has a lot to do with the mix um and how things are recorded and uh, they they all that all those different facets work together uh kind of in an inseparable way to to present parts that sound clear and distinct right. um and i th i have definitely depending on the album i do sometimes uh mix my own music but i always record my music um but usually like like at least the records we're talking about yod and karen the the bigger more important ones that i do uh i have i have sonny de perry uh mix them for me and he is just the best at what he does and makes everything sound impressively clear uh so i can't take credit for uh for all of all, all of what you're talking about here but i do i do think about that when i write uh and and it always bothers me especially with fast bands when you can't really hear what the riff is yeah you can hear you know it's intense uh but like I just need I need me like a strong sense of melody for me to enjoy music, yeah. Um, and so that's something that I always try to imbue my music with is is like, well, can you tell what's going on right now, and is it interesting, and do you want it to happen again, you know, uh, or is it just? I mean, I I like I I do do the f like formless thing with drones, you know, where there there doesn't need to be a riff and it's just about the texture that that's has its place and that's cool and everything but uh yeah i don't know i did, did that answer over, your question you don't overdo no, no, it for though. sure yeah yeah you don't overdo it and i think one of the things with, with your these long tracks is you have a lot of 
there's breathing space. Mm. There's breathing space within a lot of the the areas of that you know where you don't have 18 layers of guitars and you you haven't gone crazy with Pro Tools just right. loading track upon track upon track which right you can get really carried away with that shit you know what I mean like people can and they do right that's true Some yeah guys are um, guilty of that <laughs> so uh, wanted to jump into good stuff there Lauren and she's got a couple more real quick here 2017 cool. you release. A single, I guess it would almost kind of almost be a, an EP in a weird way, but it's almost 16 minutes, called The Unabating Wakefulness. And the lyrics are thus, if you don't mind, if, if I read these. Um, I desperately long to find a place to rest, at long last to lay my tired head, weary with a frantic pain, manic from this heavy yoke, like an old diviner my heart projects, a mass of fear, worry, doubt, and shame. I tremble, boil, and bubble over. My burning eyes burst inside my pounding skull, and I realize <laughs> or, it's very, 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 very cannibal corpse there for a second. Uh, and I realize how far I must still go. Are these the lyrics? Because I pulled these off of yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, Encyclopedia Metal. They're I, just fun. They're just funny to hear in this context. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> weird. I realize how far I must still go, how disheartening this length of life has this prolonged panic. Clearly, this is about insomnia. Okay. Yes, yes, it is. Because I've lived this life a <laughs> lot. Okay, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. We're going to talk a little bit about mental health issues. You already talked about depression, and I'm yeah. I'm hoping you'll go with me here a little bit. Um, because I am a fellow sufferer. Uh, yes. Anxiety in particular, insomnia. Depression more as a result, I call it the fear triangle. Mm. You, you, you have anxiety, which begets fear, which begets depression, which begets all the physical stuff. And one of those manifestations can be insomnia. So I think you probably are aware of what I'm speaking of. Mm -hmm. um, I've had psychologically damaging periods of insomnia thanks to modern pharmacology. I'm not going to get into the details. People that know my channel know I'm a very open person. Though. And I was curious if you felt comfortable talking about this subject matter, perhaps as much background as you'd like to share on the topic and possibly your personal struggles with both anxiety, insomnia, and the mental health <laughs> circle that we just kind of talked about. And I, I think I realized sadly that the stigmata of the words mental health Whenever anyone says mental health, everybody goes, "Oh, I don't, I don't want to hear this, man. It's getting mm. too, it's too intense, you know." Because a lot of people don't want to look inwardly and go, "Oh, I hear this in what this guy's talking about. I see this in me." So, you know, they remain guarded, and I don't want to get into that, man. It's too mm -hmm. personal, that kind of stuff. But I, whatever you feel you want to share about all that, I'd love to talk to you about. It. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I definitely think that. And uh, that anxiety and depression are interrelated uh, for for a lot of people. Uh, they, you know, trigger one another or or are found in the same spaces. Sure. Uh, for me, insomnia was definitely just an extension of anxiety, and it's ultimately fear, I believe. Um, but. I, I'm just a really sensitive person, uh, like my nervous system. Uh, I just, I notice a lot of things, uh, that maybe other people don't, uh, and lots of things, uh, bother me, <laughs> uh, that I can't, that are outside of my, outside of my control. Yep. Yep. Um, so even even often with with ins insomnia, which I'm not struggling uh, with too badly right now, which is wonderful. Uh, a, a lot of that, you know, there's not often a single thought that's keeping me up that I'm afraid of. It doesn't really feel like that. It's like uh, there's a little bit of light in my room. There's a little bit of sound in my room. Uh, my body doesn't feel comfortable in itself. Uh, there are some things I'm thinking about, some things that I'm actually worried about, but maybe just not. And my brain just feels active. And um, that's really just really hard. And that compounds so quickly because sleep is like <laughs> so fucking important. And when you can't sleep, 
everything gets so much worse. It, and yeah, when everything right, gets yeah. so much worse, you're less likely to sleep. And like, it's yeah. such a vicious cycle. It's a, it's a, as I said, it's a compounding thing that just builds upon. And I don't think that people that don't understand panic, don't understand anxiety attacks, even if you've never really, like my daughter has pretty heavy anxiety and did she got from me and she would try to explain to her long-term boyfriend what it was like and he just couldn't get it and then mm. one day he had a panic attack mm. and he came to her he was like oh my god now i finally get it people out there that don't suffer from anxiety you have no idea how fortunate you are mm. you just don't get it you know if you had to jump in my body for a day or an hour sometimes and it's you know it, it ebbs and flows but i still battle it and i unfortunately went way way back we're talking as i said i'm 57 so going back to the early 90s there was no internet there was no way of researching stuff i got put on medication that really 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 fucked my life up mm, that's too really bad. almost almost killed me and lauren knows that and um, I am pretty certain it has something to do with my current health struggles that when I was on that for so long and when I got off of it, it was so devastating that, you know, so my my little PSA is don't go the pill route if you can afford to not do it because it, it has a payback. That's just I'm not telling anyone what they should or shouldn't do. I'm just saying it's a very think about it before you do it. Educate yourself intensely on it. That's all I'll say on that. So did you 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 see you feel you said you're feeling much better now you're in a much better space yeah i I am right now and i mean it it does just ebb and flow uh i i use medication i've been on and off it uh but right now it's something that's helpful to me for Uh, depression or for depression and anxiety and insomnia um but um i think the thing that helped me the most was just a massive amount of acceptance. Uh, I tried to change the way that I thought about insomnia and anxiety and depression and um, be okay with it and kind of almost make friends with it in a way because I know it's it's always going to come back. Right. And I'm pretty used to it now at this point. Oh, here, here it comes again, you know, like... And it doesn't, like, make... It doesn't take it away, but there's kind of this feedback loop that can happen and this extra layer about like you're you're feeling depressed about feeling depressed or you're feeling anxious about being anxious. Anticipatory and that, anxiety. Anticipatory you're anticipating how bad it's gonna be. Yeah. And it just makes it a million times worse. That's the kind of stuff that I think I've kind of got a handle on now. Cool. Where I, I'm not I'm not uh, lost in the extra layer. Uh, and I can just ride out the experience and be okay with it. And uh, how is that, that for you getting on stage? Uh, st- that's not a problem for me. The, really? the performance is very cathartic. Okay. And, and that's the other cool. big, big thing that I would say about this whole topic is just having a uh, an outlet uh, for me, a creative outlet. Um, but maybe for someone else, it's just like journaling or therapy or or whatnot but having some sort of outlet for your thoughts and feelings is so immensely helpful and and cathartic and i think that ms moore uh has helped me heal so much over the past decade that's really awesome, really man. thankful I, for music and art i really appreciate you talking about that because that's not an easy thing for people to open up about and talk about and i think anybody seeing this might that might really help and i just want to make one thing clear for me, the medication thing worked quite well for a long, long time until mm-hmm. it stopped working. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say on that. And I had no way to educate myself back then. I had no way to, you couldn't, you couldn't go check a book out on, in the library about pharmacology, about that kind of stuff. It just wasn't out there. So mm-hmm. I don't, I'm no judgments here whatsoever. I'm just saying that if you're in this, fight and it is a battle it's you're a warrior trust me you are you are a warrior i am a warrior um those of us that struggle with this educate yourself as much as you can exhaust Mm -hmm. all options until you can't do anything otherwise that's all i'll say 
for sure. Uh, Lauren, you had another cool, another great question here about your songs are long, which they are. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I already, I already asked that one. So I'll oh, just get the last one. Um, anyway, yeah. Thank you so much for talking about that. Um, I will say when you were talking about, uh, feeling like uncomfortable with like stimuli and stuff, like I have like ADHD and I'm like definitely identify as like neurodivergent and like, I totally understand that, that like mm -hmm. I will, you know, one minute I'll be talking to a bunch of people in like a public place and I'll feel totally fine. And then suddenly I realize how loud and how many things are happening. And then mm -hmm. like, yeah. I kind of just like shut down and like I don't really get like anxietized about it as much as like I kind of do this like disassociate where like shut I kind of just stop being there yeah. like mm -hmm. I'm there physically but like mentally it's like my I've my, seen my it. mind is like wandered so I've yeah seen um, it. no yep. thank you so much for talking about that I really appreciate it and sure, I, just yeah. say I relate to you for that um but changing gears to something else um uh so over like all the years you've been a musician I guess maybe specifically uh in your time working with working on Mismore, um is there like a specific like a specific or maybe one or two um aspects of like your mus musicianship either like at like technical like as in like being a better guitar player drummer or like your compositional and arrangement skills is there like a specific aspect of that that's improved in the, in your time with Mismore that you're particularly proud of <laughs> god i hope so uh <laughs> um i don't think i've become a better musician uh, but I do think that I've, uh, I've improved as a songwriter and, uh, and a producer. Like I've gotten a lot better, um, like on the technical side of, of engineering. Um, you can, you can really hear that if you listen to my discography. Um, and also just trying to write, you know, when you, when you make albums, uh, often, or you, you do it for for years, um, you just become curious about doing things in different ways or getting better at things. Um, and like, I, I still enjoy listening to my old music, but like, I can't really foresee myself writing another 26 minute song. I, I did that and, uh, I'm more interested in, uh, you know, it'll always be long form for me, but I'm more interested in like, uh, how, how can we do that where you get the same feeling and you feel like you've gone on a journey and all that, uh, in less time. Is that possible? More with less, right? Yeah. How can, how can we get in and get out, uh, relative to what I do? And, uh, w will that still be, uh, interesting and cathartic? And I think that that is, a uh, it's a it's a fun way to challenge myself to try to write songs in different ways and just get better at the engagement part of it. Um, that's something that I feel like I'm evolving in, and I guess it's up to uh, consumers if they think that that is uh, improvement or if that's just different or 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 what that is. But no, I, I don't feel like uh, any of my uh, performance skills have. I've gotten any better, but, but yeah, I'd like to think I have uh, more attention to detail on, on the engineering and producing side of things to make it a more engaging and uh, pleasant and professional kind of uh, listening experience. Can I have you for about 15 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll wrap it at about 15 minutes. Um, great questions, Lauren, man. When you sent me these, I was like, yeah, man, these are killer. Or chip off the old block here. I'm going to ask you uh, this. Uh, Evan asks, were you from a Pentecostal background? No, uh, I'm from just kind of a evangelical in general uh, background, but not not Pentecostal. Uh, my my family's uh, denomination is called Christian Missionary Alliance (CMA), okay. uh, and it's it's kind of just run of the mill evangelical Western Christianity, you know. My buddy Rick popped in. He, we, he was with us at um, at uh, he was the guy, other guy that was with us at uh, Decibel Fest, and um, he says just read about your brief write up on the latest issue of Decibel covering the beer fest. Cool. Oh, nice Good deal. Good deal. Um, a lot of Weird Al Yanko fan, Yankovic fans. Yeah, <laughs> cool. You brought out the Weird what, Al people, man. What, what's what's not to like? If anyone's being honest with themselves, they love Weird Al. <laughs> what's the uh, What's the one? Oh, well, fat, obviously. Or is, it, is that one fat for bad, right? Yes. What was it? What's the other one? White and nerdy? Is that the other one? 
that's yeah, one of his a, songs here. Yeah. Okay. Riding, riding dirty. Riding dirty yeah. for white and dirty, right, right. So, um, I have to apologize. My my glasses are broken and they are not paying attention. So I'm having. <laughs> um, hang on one sec here. It, it really skews my ability to see what I'm doing, though. Uh, okay, so real quick here, I kind of wanted to touch on uh, Decibel Fest, but more the live aspect of things. So how many tours have you done now with Mismore proper as a band entity? Uh, we have done, we've actually only done two tours. Mismore didn't play live for the first time till 2016. It was just mm -hmm. studio until then. And from 2016 throughout 2018, we only did one-offs, fest appearances, or like a, a big home show. In 2019, we went on tour with Hell. We did both bands every night. It was awful. Uh, <laughs> from oh, the, the it was, duty yeah, it was uh, me, yeah. me and me and Matt were both uh, double dutying. Um, was it that, just super physically exhausting? Yeah, just fit. Yeah. yeah, the shows were awesome, but it was like, oh, this is so not sustainable. Why'd we do this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did. We went down the West Coast, then we flew and we went down the East Coast, and then we flew and we did one show in Europe. So that was the first time that we did a Mismore tour. And then I had big plans to do more Cairn touring that the pandemic, pandemic. squashed. Mm -hmm. So then we got back out there. We went on tour in August of last year, August 2022, and we did a little like loop around the West. We essentially toured to Psycho Las Vegas and back. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You played at that, right? We did, yeah. Now, what was that like getting up there in front of, because that was a big audience, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Let me ask you this. You played to about, I think the Decibel Fest was probably about 25 to three, somewhere in that range. Um, and I don't know if there was that many there. That's how much the place holds. Yeah. But you're probably generally when you're more used to playing like a St. Vitus where there might be three, two, three hundred, right? Mm -hmm. In that range. What is it like to get up in front of several thousand people? Is it easier or harder? It's just different. I think it's a little bit harder just in the in a practical sense that like the stage feels too big. Yeah. You're too far from your bandmates and it's yeah. uh it's hard to hear you you have to rely on your monitor mix you know you can't really hear your amp at all and especially at a fest like there's no time to dial in your monitor right, right. so you feel at least i feel like kind of isolated up there and i'm just like i hope this is going over okay yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you don't really have the like the you're vibe not in -ears. you're not doing in ears then right no we don't yeah that's kind of expensive i guess yeah but but it is fun to get in front of that many people it's exhilarating and um just kind of cool to look out i try not to do it often but every once in a while I look out and just be like jesus christ there's so many people <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> it's, it's cool like, oh. you know but i like the uh you know i know that from the audience perspective you've got like cool lights and like the pa systems massive and like yeah, it, mu it must be a really production. impressive production. production yeah and that's always fun yeah um this one might be a touchy one if you don't if you want to avoid it just say i don't want to answer that how is your relationship with your parents and your siblings with regards to your turning away is that a problem is it understood is it accepted is it yeah, I, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I, I will say that just out of respect for them, but I, I will say it's kind of kind of all of the above. Um, it is a problem, but it is accepted, and we still uh, find positive, loving ways to interact and maintain a relationship. Good, good. Yeah. Because okay. uh, I, can, I can imagine that could be tricky. Like, I live with... I live with a guy, I live with my father, he's 82, he's the one that popped in here, I kind of take care of him, and um, he's he's a hardcore Trumper, and I absolutely despise Trump, mm -hmm. and he knows it, and it becomes is yeah. an issue from time to time, mm -hmm. an ugly issue at times, like really ugly, I have totally. to walk away so things don't get violent, you know, because he's he's ingrained, he's, he's cult, you know, um, yeah, for sure, so I, I just was kind of curious, because 
You know what they always say, man, don't talk about religion and politics. So the two things, <laughs> even amongst family members, they destroy families, right? Yeah. You know? So yeah. it's good to hear that that's cool. Um, what's, uh, when, when you, at this point for Ms. Moore, would you like to see it expand into a much more regular touring thing or are you cool with it being sort of a, a seasonal thing if you will you know what i mean yeah i mean i i would like to increase our touring a little bit and i think that that will probably happen uh but we're never going to be that kind of band that's like you know out yeah. nine months out of the year or anything right. yeah. everyone you know it's really hard to get four adults to leave yeah. their lives for a month. And uh, so, you know, I think we'll probably do at least a, a tour a year with uh, with one-offs and stuff sprinkled around there. And uh, that's that's fine, you know. So, so we we're, we're going to we're going to be getting out there and uh, and that's going to that's going to feel good, but I, I it, just the nature of it, we're never going to like tour all the time no uh, it's the nature of the music too i mean it's not yeah it's hard it's hard even for you know a bigger band like yob on a, a relapse or something like that you know they're not they're not touring nine months a year either that's for metallica and yeah, yeah. players and the and the testaments the guys where that their bands are their businesses that's their, sure their lives you know what i mean mm -hmm. um for you guys that wouldn't even probably be feasible uh what's on the horizon you mentioned another album is in the can or yeah i'm releasing a record this summer for Ms. and Moore or... for Ms. Moore, okay. yeah and there's so much exciting stuff but i'm just not allowed to talk about it okay. <laughs> but cool. but uh soon you will see cool cool yeah and some touring potentially lining up for you Soon you will see. Okay. Maryland Death <laughs> Fest, maybe? Soon you will see. Okay. I get it. I get it. Um, I think I'm closing in on the end. Gear, recording. Uh, you Are you a uh, Pro Tools guy, or what do you use? I use Logic. Logic? Got yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just what I learned on. It's easy for me, and uh, I'm comfortable with it. I had Logic the, way back when, I want to say around... 2008 2009 and i often felt like i was climbing into a spaceship cockpit trying to figure out what the fuck i was doing i was like i'm never <laughs> gonna figure i never really did figure it out i play but i'm very tech not great so mm. lauren's the tech, are difficult to learn lauren so lauren's more the the tech savvy one but even you haven't really dipped your toe deep into it either and I've I tried to learn it. how to use like Reaper and a couple other DAWs. It's just, it's very overwhelming. And, and I want to um, do it because I want to write a song for the channel. I have a, I already have my song written. I need your help with it. <laughs> Dude, look at that. It's total silence. Ah. <laughs> so, um, last thing gear wise what do you use guitar wise bass wise you know uh effects chain wise what do you i use a gibson sg standard uh for guitar and i use a rickenbacker 4001 for bass right. I, i've had my rickenbacker for uh close to 15 years chris and squire or getty lee what's that chris squire or getty lee or neither uh who's the first person Squire, yes. Oh, well, I given those options, I'd pick Getty Lee. Okay, All right. are you a um, fan? I like some Rush, yeah. Okay. I don't know if I'm a fan, but I like some ah. of their songs, yeah. Lee and, uh, excuse me, ALN, everything was going <laughs> so well, and then I just blew it. No. Uh, everything was going <laughs> so well until you said that. Uh, yeah, sorry, we have to go now. I'm, a, I'm not a, ha I'm not a hater though. I do, I do like Rush, but le less than some other bands of that era lauren will lauren will tell you i'm a like monster <laughs> monster monster fanatical rush fanatic and saw him what about 35 36 times in my life and wow going, going all the way back to 1980 was my second show i ever saw was wow. rushed for the permanent waves tour first show was kiss that'll show you how old i am that's so, tight yeah so um lauren did you have any quick things you wanted to run by uh, ALN. Uh, yeah, um, the only thing, if we're talking about gear, um, what tuning does Ms. Moore usually play in, or is it all over the place? 
Mismore uh, usually plays in B standard, and then and then from there some of the songs are in drop A. Oh, okay. yeah. Crazy it's not too crazy. Yeah, I've kind of settled in that range because it straddles. I can do the black metal and doom metal thing. If I go much lower, you can't really understand the riffs anymore when yeah, it gets fast. Get, yeah. Right. And if I go much higher, then it just doesn't crush when it gets slow. So it's it's a nice middle ground to do the double genre thing like I do. What yeah. do your parents think of your music that the, itself? Have they listened to it ever? They have listened to it. Uh, they It's not their thing. Yeah. They, re they really can't do the screaming because mm -hmm. uh, they just hear their child in pain, essentially. Okay. Uh, but we did have a big... A big moment uh, last year when we went on tour. They came and saw it live for the first time. Oh wow, nice! That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I, you know, speaking of the vocal thing, and then I'm going to let you go. I am a vocalist, and I sing, and I sing kind of in the Lane Staley range a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I have tried to do death metal vocals. I have tried to do the the you do that kind of. There's a screech that you do, mm -hmm. and I'm trying. to... Do you know Uada? They're up from up your way too, I believe, right? I don't know them personally, but I know I know the band. Yeah. yeah. The guy Jake, he has kind of a howl that's kind of like you when you do what I would call your howl. Mm -hmm. it's almost that kind of ow. Oh, it's it's I I can't I can't do it because I don't have that timber in my voice. But you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. How do you do that shit without destroying your vocal cords? Like I don't get it. Uh, you don't. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh. I don't, I don't have, uh, I'm not trained, um, but I do have a couple different uh, vocal techniques for different sounds. And the one that you're talking about, if, if I understand you correctly, uh, is, is an inward scream that I do, the super high pitched one. Yeah. So you're actually bringing the, the sound inward? For that, yes. Yeah. No way. And um, basically, it's another one of those like sum of all the parts answers where it's like, to preserve your voice, you have to think about what you're eating and drinking before you play. Uh, you have to think about how loudly you're talking to people before you play. Mm. I have a throat spray that I liberally douse my voice with, even during the performance uh, that's honey-based that I've found over the years uh, really helps. Uh, but there's... You know, all those things together do a little bit, but you're still fucking screaming, and uh, it it does affect the, your throat muscle. And if it doesn't, I probably don't like how your voice sounds, because really, really controlled vocal techniques, those screams just don't sound cool. I, I need I need to like feel the emotion, and for me that comes from usually being loud and like hopefully you're not like severely damaging yourself and you figure out what your body can handle and and settle into a, to kind of some middle ground there uh to try to preserve your voice a bit but i i just i don't like the like the way that proper vocals sound uh so th i think there's there's just there has to be some pain involved <laughs> I, it's like uh, that's just me though i don't know yeah i that's an interesting perspective it's like um we had this conversation the other night in a group thing that we were talking about we were talking about michael ockerfeld you know and during the rise of opeth from you know where he started with orchid which was more like a black metal shriek to his voice it became more of this just unbelievable death growl i mean he just had the most you know and it was all from here right and now mm -hmm. he can't do it at all he croaks and he does if you listen to and i love michael i met him many times he's a beautiful guy but he just doesn't sound the same now you know he just doesn't have the same thing and he quit smoking which was one big thing i think that that's played huge a lar large role in it um the other thing is i found that what just recently i've been having all kind of vocal issues and vocal cord issues I just saw an ear, nose, and throat guy the other day, and we've determined that years of acid reflux, I have mm. reflux pretty bad, and I don't, I wasn't always taking care of it mm -hmm. properly, and that probably has done some kind of semi, not permanent, but, but 
long term it's it's you know plus i'm 57 you don't you don't get young you don't get older and your voice gets stronger generally unless, right. you're, glenn, unless you're glenn hughes or maybe you know even rob halford doesn't quite sound the way that he did the last tour or no how could you your body yeah. changes so much as yeah. you age you know dude's pushing mid 70s you know yeah bruce too so um yeah, so look, man, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I hope it was a fruitful uh, a conversation for you um, and that we didn't get into too much that was uncomfortable for you. I did warn you ahead of time. These yeah. are the things I might want to go into, um, but I think we did a pretty good job. Lauren, I think you did a great job. I really appreciate you. you being a sidekick today. We're going to be looking forward to some new material that you can't talk about yet. Yeah. And uh, – yeah, it's going to be on Gilead, right? Profound lore. Oh, you're going to profound lore? Oh, okay. You mm-hmm. moved? I moved. moved. Yeah. That's actually a that's a significant piece of information there already. <laughs> so if you know, you know, right? If you yeah. Know. Um, well, look, thank you so much. I want to run through my quick coming up stuff, and then yeah. I'll let you get out of here. But I want you to hang out just for a minute or two after. Sure. We'll, we'll chat. Um, sure. Guys. Go check out Mismore. Links are in the description. Uh, there's Mismore. And you know, do you have a website? Yeah, I guess you do. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I my my main website is mismore.bigcartel.com. Uh, and double that, check. I thought I put it in there, but I also put your Bandcamp. Yep. I put IG. I put Facebook. I believe. Great. So all that stuff's in there. Um, Lauren doesn't have any social media. I don't think. Do you? Not no, that you know. I want to be public. <laughs> Dad, I don't want you to know about what I'm doing. Um, you're old enough. You can do what you want to do. Uh, yeah, so real quick, things are coming up. Um, you never know with me. With, with Oh, Rick had a quick question here. What's in your car that you're listening to right now? Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, ambient music. I listen to Brian Eno. I listen to Enya. I listen to, and then on the metal side, often listen to... Funeral Doom and depressive black metal like Cold World and Shape of Despair. Uh, listen to reggae too. Toots and the Maytals. I like that a lot. Okay, uh, so here's another yeah. weird. <laughs> here's another weird connection we have. This this kid right here was born to Shepherd Moons. Oh, great! One of the most beautiful albums that you'll ever, 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 ever hear. And you know, I'm a huge Enya fanatic, and their mother was, was a huge Enya fanatic. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's 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 really, really cool. Um, and I'm doing some ambient. There's going to be some ambient artists coming up here interview-wise. Brian Lustmord, I don't know, Brian Williams, Lustmord. Cool, yeah. He'll be coming up soon. And actually on Saturday, which is I can start here, Saturday on uh, May 20th at 3 p.m., uh, Eastern time, I'll be interviewing Daniel Mensch. Cool. Do you, you know Daniel Mensch? You know, don't, I don't know him personally, but yeah, I, I'm aware of him. He's from Portland, I believe. He's a Portland guy as well. Yeah. I think he's got 104 albums. <laughs> so, Whoa. Yeah, Lots to talk about. <laughs> Lots to talk about, yeah. We won't be going over his old discography, I think. Um, also, uh, on Sunday... Oh, and then I've got uh, Andrew Lyles. I don't know if you've ever heard of Andrew Lyles. Another... That Dark one Ambient I don't know. Found sound UK British guy. Um, cool. He's done stuff with. He works with Nurse with Wound. I don't know if you know Nurse with Wound. Mm-mm. Stephen Stapleton. Okay, you might want to check out some of that stuff. I'll send you some cool uh, recommendations. I think you'll thank me uh, about later. Cool. Um, so yeah, real quick. Um, Hawkwind, 1970 to 1980, nine albums, one live album, Space Ritual. I'm doing that with Melinda on Sunday, uh, the 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Tentatively, tentatively, this one's not written in stone yet, but I think it is. Alcest, deep dive. We're doing Alcest, Jimmy, uh, Future Ruins, and my buddy Serge, which most of you guys should know, on Wednesday, the 24th. Time to be determined. Saturday, the 27th. This is still a work in progress, but May 27th. I, I should have it all locked up by this weekend. We're doing a massive death deep dive. I think you're in on that, right, Lauren? Yep. A lot, a whole lot of other people with some, maybe some luminaries, some rock luminaries might be joining us for that. Although Kevin Hoffnagel from Gorguts will be there. That I know for sure. 
Uh, and then the last one to throw out there is, again, one mostly tentative but mostly confirmed, uh, Boards of Canada on uh, May 30th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time with Melinda and with my new buddy Ben uh, Steiner. So I think that's it there. I'll look at this. Look who just showed up. That's my other daughter. Oh. <laughs> Daddy. Who's a killer singer? You ever need a killer female singer? <laughs> cool. I'll send you some stuff. She's amazing. Um, anyway, uh, ALN, thank you so much for this. Thank I you for having me. The whole yeah. way without blowing it. I, <laughs> it. Um, I apologize for that. Nobody will. Pick All up good. Uh, listen, man, I appreciate it. Uh, we really appreciate your art. We appreciate what you do. And uh, you know, if you get back east uh, at some point. You know, we'll we'll try to get out and see. I'm sure Lauren will definitely be there. And um, awesome. I'm going to send you some dark ambient and some ambient suggestions. William sounds Basinski. good. William Basinski. I like William Basinski. Okay, yeah. now, you know you know that. that that's good. That's good. So William's somebody I'm sh trying to get on here. So oh, cool. All right, we will let you go, but hang loose for one minute. We're going to end there, guys. Thanks for all everybody that joined in and Hi, everyone. Maddie, you Thanks, got here in a second, babe. We'll uh, talk to you later, Maddie. Hang on one sec.